If I offered you a UFC title fight in your closest weight class... Would you take it? This isn't a short notice thing. You'll have a full camp, and there's a massive payday in it for you too. I'm guessing a good chunk of you would take that opportunity, even if you had no idea what you were doing, and would get mauled like a baby seal that walked onto the set of a Coca-Cola Christmas commercial. But believe it or not, there are fighters in the UFC who were healthy, had adequate time to train, and in some cases got offered a boatload of cash that respectfully declined their shot at that sweet, sweet gold. And today we're going to tell you their stories. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and the road to UFC 263 starts now. That's right, bet online official partners to MMA On Point are back, which means you can join us for UFC 263 using the promo code On Point to get a 50% sign-up bonus good for up to $1,000. More on that later, but for now, here are 10 fighters that actually turned down UFC title fights. Number 10, Demetrius Johnson. At the conclusion of UFC 227, after 2,142 days, a new flyweight champion had finally been crowned, but it was not so cut and dry a victory. Henry Cejudo defeated Demetrius Johnson in a razor-thin split decision. The MMA media couldn't make heads or tails of who won, and given Johnson's incredible record-breaking run, a rematch was all but guaranteed. Despite the issues between the UFC and the former champion over his unwillingness to play the promotion's games, not to mention their regular pay disputes. A few months later, though, the idea of a rematch would completely evaporate when it was announced that Johnson had been traded to one championship for Ben Askren. In later interviews, DJ would explain that he could have fought Cejudo again and stayed in the UFC doing what he had always done. Then who knows what would have been next? So why not take the opportunity to get out of my contract? I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go travel the world, fight in front of a audience that respects smaller weight classes. I, I wasn't going to pass it up. And it was absolutely his choice. The deal was not a trade in the traditional sports sense. Johnson didn't have to go to one if he didn't want, but the rematch didn't appeal to him, and when the opportunity arose for something different, he took it instead of a third fight with Triple C. Johnson won once Flyweight Grand Prix before losing to champion Adriana Morais. DJ's hurt! It's good night, Irene! But there's no doubt he'll be in the title picture at one for some time to come. Number 9. Mark Kerr in the late 1990s, the idea of the UFC heavyweight title holding the prestige it does today simply wasn't there. Yes, in North America, the UFC was still the premier promotion, but the first ever heavyweight title had only been introduced in 1997, and as we began heading into the financial ruin of the original UFC ownership, it's not exactly like they were able to throw some serious cash around. Pride Fighting Championship, on the other hand, which had started in 1997 as well, they had some generous benefactors willing to do what was needed in order to attract the top talent in the sport, if you catch my drift. And it is right around this time that Mark Kerr is exploding onto the MMA scene. At 7-0, the Smashing Machine had now won back-to-back -back UFC heavyweight tournaments. The promotion's title initially held by teammate Mark Coleman was now in the hands of Maurice Smith, and in a perfect world, Kerr would have stuck around to avenge his buddy's title defeat, but to Mark, it was already apparent that the UFC was heading down a rough road, while Pride FC was more than interested to pay him buckets of cash. And so it was a no-brainer. Become the third-ever UFC heavyweight champion, or head to Japan and fight Hoist Gracie to headline Pride 2. Now, that bout would fall through, but Mark would remain the event's headliner and a star in Japan until his career declined. Number 8. Rose Nama Yunus as I mentioned in the intro, the idea that a fighter would turn down a title fight under normal circumstances where they weren't potentially taking the fight on very short notice is almost unthinkable to a lot of us. But in Rose Nama Yunus, we have an example of being patient and being honest with herself paying off tremendously. Coming off an incredible title defense performance against Joanna Janjacek at UFC 223, Champ Nama Yunus was shockingly defeated by Jessica Andrade when she was slammed onto her head and KO'd. The loss had the former champion questioning whether she even wanted to fight anymore. She knew she was good at it, but after narrowly avoiding serious damage from the slam, due to a previous neck injury, and having felt the weight of the title, Thug Rose just wasn't entirely sure she was still interested in competing. It was during this period following the loss that Rose was offered a title fight with new champion Zhang Wei Li at UFC 248. Feeling mentally unready for that type of commitment, and knowing she wanted to work on herself, Nama Yunus declined the fight, which then went to Yin Jacek and became an all-time classic. Nama Yunus then hired what she called a mental coach to help her sort things out, and after avenging her loss to Andrade at UFC 251, the former champ was all in again on her pursuit of the title, KOing Wei with a head kick in just over a minute at 261 to recapture strawweight gold. I did it again. I am the best. <laughs> Number 7. Jorge Masvidal 
after an absolutely massive 2019 that saw Jorge Masvidal go from largely forgotten mid-tier welterweight veteran to the hottest ticket in all of mixed martial arts, he very well knew that a title fight was next and that he expected compensation on par with the level of stardom he had skyrocketed to over the course of the previous 12 months. Now, of course, the pandemic complicated things, but the money did so even further. According to Gamebred, he was offered a title fight with Kamaru Usman at UFC 251 in July, but that no room for negotiation was possible. It was take this money or don't, and we're announcing it tomorrow, so hurry up. Masvidal opted out and began putting the UFC on blast over the matter on social media and in interviews. They want me to take less money than they did on my last fight, though I'm fighting for a world championship. A lot of things just don't add up. The promotion would shortly thereafter announce Gilbert Burns as the new headliner and title challenger for the card. It looked like Jorge and the UFC were further apart than ever on the matter of money until the week before 251 was to take place when Burns was forced to drop out due to a positive COVID test. This was the UFC's first Fight Island card. They had just made a big deal with the government in Abu Dhabi. The show needed to be a banger and they needed that headliner. So with the promotion's balls now firmly in hand, Jorge was able to negotiate a new deal with the UFC to take the Usman fight on short notice and save the card. While he didn't end up winning, it turned out to be the right business decision to decline the fight in the first place. He even managed to get a rematch off the fact that he didn't have a full camp. For a guy that hasn't won since 2019, Masvidal sure is making the most of things. Number 6. Alistair Overeem the mythical version of Alistair Overeem we affectionately refer to as Uberim for his horse meat induced colossal size had a pretty great vision for his introduction into the UFC, and it involved turning down a title fight for something even better. Alistair told ESPN he was given the option to wait for the winner of the heavyweight title fight between Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos on UFC's first Fox card, which would leave the ream sidelined for about a year before his UFC debut, something he very much did not want, and so another fight was offered. The biggest star in the entire sport, Brock Lesnar. Now, Brock was coming off his title loss to Velasquez, but he was still without question the biggest draw in mixed martial arts. And so Overeem decided to take the opportunity to give Lesnar the business and then get his title fight against JDS, who ended up beating Kane. After a strong kick right to the diverticulitis, it looked like Reem's plan was falling into place perfectly. And then two months before he was set to fight for the title, that dastardly Nevada State Athletic Commission noticed Overeem had the testosterone levels of a Kodiak bear, and so he wouldn't be able to see the cage again for over a year, missing out on his title fight and then getting KO'd by Bigfoot Silva in his return. The best laid plans of mice and men, indeed. Number 5. Dustin Poirier the concept of a money fight is something that's only become recently prevalent in the world of mixed martial arts. In the past, the title was the money. There was nothing you could do greater than be a champion. But in the age of Conor McGregor, sometimes the belt is worth less than fighting a major pay-per-view draw, or in this case, Conor McGregor himself. UFC 262 was headlined by number 4 Michael Chandler, coming off his debut win against number 8 Dan Hooker and number 3 Charles Oliveira for the vacant lightweight title. Dustin Poirier, who was the lightweight number 1, was coming off a victory over Conor McGregor in a pay-per-view that sold 1.6 million buys. He was the obvious first choice for the vacant strap, but Connor isn't too big on losing a fight and then not immediately getting that win back, at least when it's possible. And so interested a third fight was already making the media rounds, literally days after Dustin's performance of the night earning TKO. And so the choice was easy according to Dana White, who revealed in an interview leading up to UFC 262 that Poirier had declined the vacant strap in order to have a third go at the notorious one. And truly it makes all the business sense in the world. The diamond gets another huge payday, he might get another win off the still ultra popular McGregor, and then he would very much still be next in line for a fight for the lightweight strap. Now, of course, he could lose, but this is definitely an instance where turning down the title fight was the right call. Number four, Dan Henderson. Money is the root of all turned down title fights. I think that's how the saying goes. Take your mind back to 2009. It's UFC 100, a crowning moment in the promotion's history. What do you remember about that night? Brock Lesnar, of course, maybe GSP's performance, but the highlight reel moment of all highlight reel moments was Dan Henderson's monstrous KO of Michael Bisping in the featured bout. It's the stuff of legends. Dan made it his damn logo. Nobody was hotter at middleweight than Hendo. He had won three in a row since losing to champion Anderson Silva, including a victory over former champion Rich Franklin. It was time for Dan to get his rematch with the Spider. There was just one slight problem. Henderson's contract was up, and seeing as he was doing so well, he wanted a bit of a pay raise for that title fight. According to Dana White, Dan wanted to be the highest paid fighter in the UFC, but Hendo says he just wanted a modest raise. Whatever the case, the title contender opted to pass on his opportunity to fight Silva again, and signed a four-fight deal with Strikeforce instead that saw him capture the promotion's light heavyweight title and TKO Fedor before coming back to the UFC for, I presume, more money. If that modest raise for that title fight was what was being asked for, it sounds like Uncle Dana should have taken the deal this time. Number 3. Nate Diaz 
Ever since going from 20 and 20 to six figures or more guaranteed every time he steps into the cage, including a disclosed $2 million payday for his rematch with Conor McGregor, Nate Diaz has been incredibly selective with his fights. Only four bouts in the last six years. Now, you would think that an offered title fight would be enough to get the Stockton star into the cage. But if you think that, then stand there like Dana and let Nate slap you in the face. Six weeks out from UFC 219, the promotion was in need of a headliner still. It was at that point that rumors began to surface of a welterweight title fight between Diaz and Tyron Woodley. Coming off the pair of bouts with McGregor, Nate was expecting a big payday for his next outing, reportedly $15 million. According to Diaz, the UFC said, what the fuck? So Nate declined the title opportunity. A few months later, Woodley would claim that Diaz was offered to him for his next title fight again, and Nate even said afterwards that he thought Woodley was his best option. Correct. Then Dana White went on UFC Tonight, said Nate had turned down every fight they offered, but that Tyron was never one of them, and said the champion claiming the fight was offered was a lie. You couldn't be more wrong. He couldn't be more full of and uh, it's absolutely not true. However many incarnations of that fight actually existed, all of them ultimately fell through, and Nate wouldn't see the cage again until the Anthony Pettis fight in 2019. Number two, George St. Pierre. When the greatest welterweight of all time, George St. Pierre very suddenly left the sport in 2013 after his ninth straight title defense in a close split decision win over Johnny Hendricks at UFC 167, fans weren't entirely sure what to make of it. Retirement in MMA isn't exactly permanent, and St. Pierre, who would vacate his title, didn't even use that word. He was just taking some time off, implying that at some point he would be ready to come back. And in the eight years since that fight, there have been more than a few offers to try and coax the former champion back into the cage with gold that have failed. According to former 170 pound champion Tyron Woodley, there were five to six offers to St. Pierre to return during his reign and compete for the title that were all declined by the GOAT, a story in part at least GSP's team have corroborated. St. Pierre has also revealed to TMZ that he turned down the chance to fight current champion Kamaru Usman. To fight for the welterweight title against Kamaru Usman and, and risk it all, there's more cons than pros, so it's not worth it for me. Of course, in leaving, GSP turned down a rematch with Hendricks, a fight that Dana White was adamant take place after the decision in their first bout. You owe it to Johnny Hendricks to give him that opportunity to, to, to fight again. A fight with Robbie Lawler in 2015 was the talk of the division every time Ruthless had a title fight, and it sounded like at the very least, White and Lawler wanted the bout, but it never materialized, an offer only coming officially after Robbie had lost the title to Woodley. About GSP declined for not having a set date or venue. So yes, since St. Pierre left welterweight, he's been offered to fight at least every single champion that has come after him, but it doesn't appear he's in any rush to return to the division he once dominated. Number 1. Fedor Emelianenko there's turning down title fights, and then there's our number one entry. It's 2009, and Fedor Emelianenko is without question the greatest heavyweight fighter in the world. Now 31 and 1 with not a single legitimate loss on his record for the near decade he had competed, the former Pride champion was at his peak, and very recently embarrassed two champions from the UFC's recent heavyweight title history, Tim Sylvia and Andre Arlovsky. Fedor was meant to fight world's number two Josh Barnett at the third Affliction event, but a PED fail would cause Barnett to fall out and Affliction to collapse, leaving the last emperor on the open market. It was at this point that Dana White's eyes lit up with dollar signs like Scrooge McDuck. Brock Lesnar, the biggest draw the UFC had ever seen, was their current heavyweight champion, and if Dana could get Fedor to sign on the line which is dotted, a fight between the two would be the biggest moneymaker in the history of the sport. White threw everything he had at Emelianenko, flying him out to an island off the coast of Venezuela to negotiate, and offering a rumored $2 million guaranteed a fight plus pay-per-view points. White said in later interviews that the amount they did offer for the fight was ridiculous, that he and Lorenzo Fertitta were actually relieved it was turned down because he believed they would have gotten burned by the deal. In the end, it was the UFC's unwillingness to co-promote the bout with Fedor's partner M1 Global that caused The Last Emperor to turn down the insane offer to fight Lesnar for the title. The offer was apparently made a second time in 2012, but Emelianenko, who had retired briefly, was uninterested in a bout with Lesnar, who was at that point no longer champion. He would return in 2015 against Jadeep Singh, leaving likely tens of millions of dollars on the table. Thanks again to our official partners, Bet Online. Make sure to come and join us over at betonline.ag to get a 50% sign-up bonus good for up to $1,000. You can play along with us on June 12th at UFC 263 for our live in-studio fight companion. Huge shout-out to Max Randall for editing this video together. Follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.